Hey, Barry, we are especially happy to be joined by the man that they used to call Mr. Olympia, Jerry Stubbs. Barry, how cool is that? It's pretty cool to me. Now, a lot of people it might not have been too cool for, but uh, when I first went under the mask, you know, that it was intriguing for me because, you know, as a teenager, you know, a lot of people uh, look at their appearance and all, but I had thin hair when I was growing up. And 15, 16, 17 years old, I had real thin hair. So I knew I was going to go bald. And one day, uh, old Bob Armstrong said, hey, man, you need to put you on a mask and go with Mr. Olympia because your body looks good and so on and so on. And I said, you know, I'm going to do that. And that's what I did. I put that mask on and I went into Mr. Olympia. After that, it was just, you know, I moved on up here, moved on up in Mid-South again with Junkyard Dog and against Junkyard Dog at one time. And Ted DiBiase and all the greats, uh, you know. So, it, so, it was, it, so let, me, let me ask you, uh, this is a question I ask uh, every guest. Uh, when uh, Jerry Stubbs was a kid, uh, when did you first start getting into wrestling and who was the first wrestler that you were really, uh, you found yourself interested in? Well, you know, I never was interested in a lot of wrestlers, but I had a friend that was Robert Fuller, and he lived in the area, and we knew, and I grew up, you know, I was in the police department, and I knew him, my my cousin, and myself, and all. we all went to school, and, and we'd all play around, you know, and one day that he just he just said, hey, we need somebody on TV, you want to work? And I said, sure, I'll come up and work, you know, I've been doing that, I said, as long as y'all don't kill me, I'm gonna, I'll come up, <laughs> and so... I went up there, and, and then on, it was just, you know, every so often, I'd do a lot of TVs. I got to work with Harley Race. I got to work with all the greats, man, the Anderson Brothers. Now, are we uh, talking about the old uh, Georgia Championship wrestling area here? Right, right. Okay. The Georgia Championship, because I lived around this area, and, I, and I, I had a job. So I would do a lot of, lot of uh, uh, jobs for them and go to different places, and they would book me, and I'd make more doing that than I would in the police department, because back then you didn't make a whole lot of money. So uh, I would do that, and, and just one thing led to another, so it just so happened, you know, I went up to Knoxville and got in with the Fullers and, and, and worked as a matador one time under the mask, and, uh, and so on and so on, and eventually when we went to uh, Panama City and, and Pensacola area, we bought that, well, I said the Fullers bought the territory, they took me with them, and that's when I put the mask on here and built myself up. And just, you know, from there, it was just up, up, up. Yeah, so a couple of things, too. If you look at the early part of your career, which would I, it looks like it was 1976 when you started, uh, you uh -huh. worked with some amazing talent that was also up and coming at that point. Guys like Ricky Steamboat and Rick Martell and Bob Backlund. So you had all these right. guys all these guys who were young guys who became, you know, you all became a real force in professional wrestling. Who would you say your earliest influences when you were wrestling? Who was, who was kind of responsible for molding Jerry Stubbs? I would say it was, uh, uh Rocky Johnson. He took me down to Griffin when he was in Atlanta for a long, long time. I worked with the police department. He said, come on down, work out with us. And I did. I worked out with him and the rock rock couldn't have been more than two and a half foot tall when we started down there. So I knew him when he was a kid and almost a baby and, and so on. But he was the one that really kind of stuck me out there and said, Hey man, you got it. You just need to do it. You know? So we worked out on weekends on Sundays when we wasn't doing anything. He'd take me down there and work out with me and beat me up and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and I just enjoyed it. And one day it just came to where either I got to do the police job or either I got to go with, on the road with the, the, wrestling to food. Wow. And, and so Jeff and I both, uh, our, all of our formative years were spent in the state of Florida. And as I go through all my files, you had one match in Tampa on April the 27th, 1976. You filled in for Skip Young, Sweet Brown Sugar, and teamed with Don Curtis to face uh -huh. Bob Orton Sr. and Bob Orton Jr. So how come, how come you never got a run in the state of Florida? Uh, I don't know. You know. A lot of times, you know, they would call and, and only and, and all of them would send me down to uh, Tampa to work TV. I wasn't working in that area, and they had all the guys that they, they needed, I guess, at that time. And never was a spot to where I could go and, and work for a while. So I never was asked to go down in the Tampa area. I just 
I was just asked to come down and do several TV, you know, uh, spots uh, for the guys and, and so on. And they'd fly you down there and fly you back home. Uh, and that's all. I never was asked to go to Tampa because I, I would have went to Tampa. I love Tampa. Let me ask you, Jerry. I happened to uh, I was doing a search uh, on YouTube of some of the uh, matches. There's quite a quite a bit of Jerry Stubbs out there for the uh, folks listening. If you want to really see a guy that uh, had his uh, had his stuff together, and I noticed one of the very early matches that's out there on YouTube is a match I want to see from like maybe summer of '78. You were in Mid Atlantic uh, in the Carolinas, and you had a TV match with Harley Race. Do you remember that? Yes, yes. That's when I first started. And, and, and I did pretty good. I went more than five minutes. No, I was going to say, I mean, you're in with the guy that, at that at that point. He was in his prime, uh, Harley mm-hmm. Race. Man, that must have been a real learning experience to be able to, you know, just be at his feet and, and learn all the stuff that he could show you. Oh, yeah, man. And he, he was just a master. He was the master. And, you know, I went on. I said, man, I feel privileged to go that long with the world champion. You and know, now, again, was that was that just a, a TV appearance? Were you in that area or just going in for TV? Yeah, it was a TV appearance, but I was working that area. I was working Charlotte with Steamboat and, and, uh, and all the guys up in that area at that time. Uh, I was working with them, and, and they just come. They said, hey, we need somebody to work with Harley Race. And I stuck my hand up, and I said, I'd love to, you know. And uh, they said, okay, you got it. Come over here and get with Harley. And yeah, I, I, I got over there and got with Harley, and he said, boy, I just, you know, just will, will it be easy? And I'm going to make you look like a champion. I said, in five, six minutes, he made me look like a champion. You know? So, and I said, hey, man, I couldn't, you know, then I saw him again in Japan. We went to Japan a few times, and we talked this, that, and the other, and he told me to do this and do that. And uh, Wrestling 2, Mr. Wrestling 2 was a, a big influence in me getting in the business and doing what I did. Uh, he he would coach me and tell me what I need to do, and what I didn't need to do, and he'd hit me with that knee every once in a while because they'd put me against him and, and TV and make him go sometimes. And he'd hit me with that knee, and he said, "How'd you like that?" You know, <laughs> and I'd laugh. I said, "Oh, I loved it." You know. Yeah, I'm a, I'm going to get to Mr. Wrestling 2 in a little bit because I got there's more to that story that I want to talk to you about. But I wanted to ask you, so how long did you stay in the Mid Atlantic area? Do you remember? Uh, I was there probably close to three years, maybe. Oh, you were there that long. Yeah. Or two and a half, three years. I was there. I went in the first time as your stuff and did a little deal. Da, 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 da. And then later on, I went back in after, after I got built up as Mr. Olympia and we teamed up with junkyard dog. Gotcha. So if I look at it too, the mid Atlantic area working for the Crockett's, uh, looks like the first territory where they really started to give you a little bit of a push too. where in Georgia, you had been around Georgia for a couple of years, but you get to the mid Atlantic area and you're, 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 you're on kind of a win streak at this point. You're getting a bit of a push. Uh, I've always thought this too. And, and I said this to Jeff earlier too, was there ever any consideration for your career to go national, to say, to go up north or to go out west. It it seems like you stuck around the south and maybe went as far as to work for Watts in the Mid-South area. But I've been saying this for years. You had every tool uh, to be a world champion. You were in the ring. There was nobody smoother than Jerry Stubbs uh, in the 1980s. So did you ever consider going up north or out west? Yeah, I did, and I and you know, and I, I inquired around about it, and uh, so on and so on. Went to a lot of Japan trips, you know, with the guys and all that, but never had that really person to say, "Hey, we'd like for you to come to uh, up here in New York or whatever." I did one time. Uh, with me and Arn Anderson, we were going. Rick Flair was taking us up to New York, uh, and we was going to work for New York. Arn went, and uh, but at that time, I developed a. Uh, uh, blood clot in my leg, uh, and I, and that was I was going to be the only. Actually, at that time, I would have been the only mass wrestler. At that time, Flair said, "You'll be the only one. Won't be another." You know, and I developed that uh, blood clot, and that just knocked my whole thing out of. Me. So let me just ask you: When at at what point in time? Uh, what was the mechanizations like? How did you? 
uh, get approached to go to Mid South with the Mr. Olympia uh, mask and as a Mr. Olympia character. W Bill called you, or who called you? How did that all, all start to work? Uh, what happened? I think Ron Fuller called. He said, but he said Bill Watts called. He said they've been looking at some pictures and some films of you, Mr. Olympia, and and they trying to make a decision between you and Mike Sharp at the time, uh, which one they were going to take, and and. Then they called back and they said, we would like for him to come over here. We'll do this. We'd like for him to come talk. We talked about a guarantee and so on. And, and Junkyard Dog was there. Him and Bill was kind of tight. And uh, Junkyard Dog says, I want you to be my partner. You know, this, that, and the other. And I said, I'd love to be your partner, you know. And and we did. We, we were a partner for, I guess, close to almost two years before I turned on him. And, and we went that area. But uh, hey, we had a good run. Everything just started to chill. It just started to come up, come up, come up, you know. So hey, I'll be with you in just a minute. Uh, yeah, it just started to come up, you know, and everything was good. So uh, uh, and and it just clicked, you know. So I'm and just curious. I'm just run out of there. I'm just curious, Jerry. Uh, Bill Watts, of course, was notoriously protective of JYD, as, as he should have. I mean, he was his biggest star in the area. So were you given any kind of, uh, hey, uh, listen, Jerry, uh, we need to uh, have you do the bulk of the work on the tag here, and you give the hot tag to uh, to, to JY, so uh, you know he gets put over the like the champ. Was it pretty much something like that? Yeah, he, he all the time, you know, say, so, you know, JYD is our star. And I said, I understand that. I said, I'm, I'm the second star because I'm going to be with him, you know. And yeah. I said, whatever he needs, I, was home, I, I said, I can carry the match. I, at that point, I was in good shape. I did this. I did that. I said, you just leaving me. I tell dog every time we got a dog, you just take it easy. I'll let you know when we're coming. When we well, and, there, I'll, and, of course, you get the rub from uh, from being his partner, which is nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it made me a star instant down there. You know, they started calling me. uh I forgot what Gaston. You ever heard of the word Gaston? It's, it's something down in New Orleans, down in the Cajun part. And it, they always told me, I said, y'all keep calling me Gaston. Who is Gaston? And they'd tell me, it's the alligator man in the swamp. <clears throat> I said, I remind y'all of the alligator man in the swamp. And they said, oh, yeah, you, you Gaston. You Gaston. I said, okay, I'm Gaston. <laughs> Well, I hope it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, man. They either liked you down there, or they told you they didn't like you. Yeah, which is uh, we've heard we've heard so many stories. I think from Jim Cornette as well of uh, of fans and just you know how crazy some of those fans could be. So, Jerry, I'm going to take a left turn with my questioning right now, as I often do right. when we get on. Uh, we have a, a celebrity with us, and uh, so our my partner Jeff Baldrin is a uh, born in Tokyo, and uh, he has been in South Florida now for some 35, 40 years, but he's moving to kind of your neck of the woods. He's moving to a suburb of Atlanta uh, called uh -huh. Alpharetta, and the first thing we've got to do for Jeff is we've got to figure out where we're going to be able to feed this boy. So, so when Jerry Stubbs goes out – goes out to dinner and i got the first thing i'm going to ask do you go out to for, for barbecue because barbecue is a favorite of ours where would you uh, go locally to get good food or good barbecue in the area well if you go i don't know a whole lot about alpharetta but i mean you're going to find a good barbecue place because there's not any bad eating places in alpharetta uh, you'll get barbecue you'll get good steaks you'll get good chicken you get all the good food that, you know, that we wish we could get on this end of the town, but we don't. Some of those restaurants we don't have, but they don't have, <clears throat> when you get to Atlanta, there's a thing on TV that says Atlanta Eats, and it tells you the good spots to go. Uh, I would listen to that. I would I'd go in on my, on my email or my, my app or whatever and look at AtlantaEats.com, and I'm telling you, there, there, there's so many good places to go in Atlanta, uh, and Alpharetta, Alpharetta to Atlanta. When you go a little bit south, we get a few of them, but we don't get the great ones. And, and Alpharetta, they get all the great ones. So there's Jerry, not a bad me, place. Let, Jerry, let me ask you, when you go not all the way up to Alpharetta, but just into Atlanta, have you ever had a chance to go to a place called Fox Brothers Barbecue? Say that again. Fox Brothers Barbecue? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, Fox man. Brothers is big down here, too. 
Yeah, that is yeah. some good food right there, boy. And I plan yeah, to be yeah. a regular there, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that means oh, yeah. I'm probably going to pack on a good 40 pounds. I'm sure uh, I'm looking yeah, forward to they that. Yeah, have, they have good, uh, some home cooking stuff, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, Jerry, I have another question. Jerry, do you eat a lot of pizza? Do you like, do you like pizza? Yeah, I like pizza. As a matter of fact, we just got through eating pizza at Godfather's. There you go. So this is my question, Jerry. This has been a big topic of conversation uh, within our Facebook group. But whenever, again, whenever we have a guest on, some people like to put pineapple on pizza, Jerry. I, quite frankly, I'm not a fan of that. What does the great Jerry Stubbs think of pineapple on pizza? No, I, I got to have my regular pizza. I either got to have a Supreme with extra cheese and, and some more pepperoni on it. And and that I can't I don't have no pep uh, no pineapple. If I want a pineapple, <laughs> I fix me a, <laughs> I fix me a pineapple sandwich now. Pineapple sandwich with a little mayonnaise on the bread. That's a heck of a sandwich. Really, I've never I've never yeah. heard of that one before. I've never heard of that pineapple. either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You Breaking need to K. on pineapple sandwiches here, Jerry. <laughs> yes, sir. You need to try that one. That's, that's a good one. Sure so, is. So let me let me ask you a question now. Let me go back to somebody that you mentioned just a couple minutes ago, and that's uh, Mr. Wrestling Two. So uh -huh. one of the other things that's on YouTube that's available for the folks, and I'll post a link on our uh, Facebook page, is the tremendous angle that was done with you and Mr. Wrestling Two, Johnny Walker. Uh, it involved uh, some uh, some items of Johnny's that were destroyed in his suitcase or were in your suitcase. Why don't you tell us about the genesis of that angle and what you remember about that whole time slot and that time period when you and uh, you and Johnny Walker had some heat with one another on TV? Right. Well, what we did, Bill Watts came to me and he said, "Look, Gary," he said, "We got we got two masked men coming." He said, "I need to do something with one, and I may have to move one." I said, "Okay." I said, "Well, why don't you turn me heel against wrestling too?" And I'm jealous because. He's coming in and he, he's getting all the glory and I'm not getting none. And, you know, he's the other masked man. And then I start to do things to him. And uh, sooner or later, he catches me and confronts me and we do this big deal and so on. And he said, I don't know. Let me think about it. So he had to think about it to make sure it's his. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he <made sure laughs> So he gets right full credit. His <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he want he want to make sure he said, okay, I've been thinking about that. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. But it wasn't like we're gonna do what you wanted to do. We but it was mostly what I'd been talking about. So we did the deal and so on and so on and and then me and Ted started uh, uh, teaming up against him and Chavo Guerrero and several more. Uh, Tiger I Conway match with and, yeah Tiger Conway. That was another one. So we had some good runs with those those guys, you know. And uh, one night we had a, a big uh, free for all in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Me and Ted DiBiase against Wrestling Two, and Ted did something, screwed Mister Wrestling Two, and uh, boy, they hit the ring, man. We we got out, and all the security guards left. Believe it or not, they left us. They did not help, and we got the wrestlers coming from the back. We hit the fairgrounds in Tulsa. And uh, Ted got bit, bit one of his fingers. The guy bit one of his fingers almost off. We had to go to the hospital that night and so on and so on. So, hey, it got rough sometime, man. But I'm telling you, the more it got rough, the more money we make. So so in the Mid-South Territory, it's you know, Jim Cornette on his show has talked about the fans, some of the notorious places uh, in the Mid-South area for fans. Where did you find the worst fans? Was it, you know, Tulsa? Was it Louisiana? Where was it? Uh, my worst fans is New Orleans because once I turned on Young Dark Dog, man, I had people trying to kill me. Uh, you know, so it, I think that was one of my worst spots. And the other spot was when I was over in uh, uh, Southeastern with Ron Fuller and that group was Mobile. It was kind of like the same as New Orleans. I don't, you know, same kind of people, same same kind of atmos atmosphere or whatever. But when I turned on Young Dark Dog, I'm telling you, I, I had to fight my way back, and, you know, and every time I went to the ring, I had to fight my way there to get there just to work, you know, so. Well, like you it. said, though, you're getting paid. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. And and I tell them, too, man, I'm going to make some more money. Y'all just keep coming, because I'm going to knock one of you out each time you come up, <laughs> you know. So it, it was well, fun, you know, 
And I, I wasn't a big brawler in my day, you know. I was a small guy coming up out of high school. I weighed about 145. But as soon as I got into the wrestling business, I got, you know, more and more. But at 145, I, I'd, I'd fight you in a heartbeat, you know. And that was some of my problem in high school. I'd fight you in a heartbeat. Don't, you know, don't don't cross my path. I mean, you're going to have it out. Uh, and so I got in a lot of trouble back then. But I was a go-getter and a fighter, so. I think that helped longer, you know, later on in the years. I think that helped. So one of the other things too that the uh, the Bill Watts territory was known for were these insanely long road trips, where uh, you know you, you might be traveling from city to city, several hundred miles. So who was? Did you have a regular traveling partner? And uh, what did you guys do to pass the time? You know, if you're going 600 miles. You guys are, you're probably having fun. And I've heard some of the stories about from some of the guys. So who did you hang with? Who did you travel with? And uh, any good road stories you can share with us? The, the most, uh, me and Dog, try, uh, we traveled mostly. Bill Watts sold him a Mercedes that he had, almost give it to him. And, and uh, Dog didn't like to drive. So he'd say, hey, hey, O, he called me O, Mr. O, come here. You want to drive? He said, look, let's go work out as soon as we can in the morning and we'll go eat and we'll take off. We'll go to the show. You drive. I won't charge you any trance or any, you know, any money or whatsoever. And I drove because I didn't mind driving, you know, I was used to drive. So we, we'd do that and we'd make all these shots and, and so on and so on. And a lot of times when we had stay over, we, uh, we stayed in the same room with each other. And, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, dog, dog was in, you know, he, his, his family was everything to him. And when his, his, uh, uh, when he was going to see his daughter graduate, you know, and he flipped that, his car and all that and, and died, man, it just, it just tore me up. Uh, cause I remember a lot of times he said, I'm going to make sure I see her graduate. I'm going to make sure I see her get married. You know, he always said that. And, and that just tore me up back then, you know, and, uh, other than that, I kind of, uh, there might be several people I'd get in there and say, hey, can I ride with y'all tonight or ride with y'all or whatever. But most of the time, it was just dog in that area. So let me let me ask you, just so we can put this in context for uh, for people that haven't seen a lot of Mid-South and aren't familiar with the legend of JYD, especially in the New Orleans area. So you're driving in the car with him. Just how incredibly over was that guy in that area? Oh, Dog would talk about. It. He said, "You know what? What's that?" He talked to me about. What do you think I ought to do tonight? I said, "Dog, you just keep doing what you've been doing. Don't you hear them people talking? Don't you hear them people hollering, screaming? JYD? Don't you hear that when they, you play that bad to the bone?" He said, "I said, well, I go out with you. I got chill bumps, so I know how they feel." He said, "You think so? You think I?" Ought to? I said, "No, nah, hey, I'll, I'll get the match started. I'll get it going. This, that, and the other." You come in and do what you normally do is uh, destroy ever whoever's there, and we'll keep moving. And he said, "Okay, I'll, 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 yeah, let me think. Are you sure that's right?" And I say, "That's right. Hey, that's what we're going to do tonight. You know, just trust me." And we go out. When we get through, he'd say, "Yeah, you had it right, man. You had it right. I appreciate it." But besides that, I, I'm really referring to like the his celebrity status. So, like you know, you talked about, oh, we're going to go work out, and then we're going to go have some, some breakfast somewhere. I mean, mm -hmm. could he in that area really go out in public and not be inundated with fans, or was he able to just kind of blend in? He uh, several places we went to was uh, kind of uh, rough because everybody wanted an autograph and everybody wants to see JYD. But we did a lot of things like when we worked out at Foxy's Gym in, in uh, New Orleans, we'd go early. We'd be we'd be there at five o'clock, so we didn't have a lot of people that were, you know, bothering us or whatever, whatever. And he'd like to then go eat early, and so on. There'd be a few people, you know, that that, that recognized him. But if we stopped somewhere along the way, it didn't matter where it was: Oklahoma, Louisiana, Mississippi. There's a bunch of them that knew who he was. Well, so one of the things that interests me also is uh, you were actually one of the NWA World Junior Heavyweight Champions when you won the title from Les Thornton, uh, January right. 1981. And, and the lineage of that title is, uh, in my opinion, that's one of the most important titles I think ever in professional wrestling 
based off of the quality of wrestlers who held it. And for years, that was kind of known as the Danny Hodge title, you know, and, and obviously one of the greats of all time. Uh, and then it was Danny Hodge and Hiro Matsuda and a guy like Les Thornton also, just a tremendous, tremendous wrestler. Uh, what, what was it like, you know, being in the ring with a guy like Les Thornton, who was a ring general, uh, trained in the British style of professional wrestling? Oh, it, I, it, was, it was so, so easy. So go with when I got the United States Junior Heavyweight Champion, I was I was actually I looked good. If you can look back where uh, pictures and all that stuff, I looked real good at that point. I only weighed about two twenty, two twenty five, and uh, I was well built, had a good tan, had a little hair back then, and, and and my body looked good and and so on. And I worked with him. I worked with a guy named Dickie Steinborn, you know, uh, Les Thornton, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, even the world champion, uh, uh, Nelson Roll. Uh, so, I mean, I, I worked with all those guys, you know. And back then, I, I mean, I, I just had it going for me. I just knew, that, hey, man, give it to me. Just let me run with it. Just put me in the middle of the car and let me go. And uh, that's what they did. And I had a good run through that. And then eventually I got a little little heavier, a little outgoing, and, and had to change my appearance. So, well, let me ask you, you know, you talk about all the guys that you've, uh, you wrestled with, that you dealt with, you know, talking about JYD. So after you leave Mid-South, I know you go, uh, eventually down to Southeastern and, right. uh, as Mr. Olympia and they hook you up with a young wrestler, just starting to make his way who they, I uh, believe call super Olympia when he first came down there. Tell us about the formation and as the development that you saw as the tag partner of Marty Lundy who we know as Arn Anderson. Right. Well, we were over in Louisiana, and uh, Marty was looking for a place to go, and him and a little referee that they had that he wanted to bring with him. He was living with his, his grandmother, and his grandmother finally passed away. And I said, come on out here. And so I got I got him to book out there with, with Ole and so on, and we worked. He, it was Marty Lundy and so on and so on, and we worked out, worked out, worked out, and I said, I told him one day, I said, I'm going back to Southeast. And I said, when you get through over here, why don't you come over there and we'll call you a Super Olympian. And you can be my partner and we'll do this, that, the other. And later on, uh, we'll, we'll do something else. But it, that would be a good start. And I'm bringing you in as Super Olympian. And later on in there, we turned against each other. And people just, I mean, they just went wild. Uh, and then eventually, me and him teamed up as a, uh, uh, as partners, uh, and, and had a heck of a run with all, all the tag team people, Robert and, uh, Jimmy Golden, Ron Fuller, Bob Armstrong, Brad Armstrong, the, the Armstrongs, uh, and we had a heck of a run. Uh, and then, you know, we, we did a deal where he, he lost the, the mask, mask and so on. And then he went and done his thing. And then I brought him in as my partner and we had a heck of a run, like I said. And then later on, uh, we had a loser leave town, and uh, I left, actually left, and had to go to Japan. And when I got back, I put a, a mask on and come back to Super Olympia, I mean, Mr. Olympia, which people knew who I was. But he couldn't say, hey, you got to go because you lost and you got to go because that was my deal. You know, everybody knew me as Mr. Olympia, and that's what I'm going to stay. And me and him had a big run then. But just a guy that I'm sure you could see had all the talent in the world and just oh, needed, you know, some oh. experience and stuff like that. Oh, oh man, hey, smooth. Arn yeah. Anderson was as smooth as they come, and just like people used to tell me, I knew you could do it because I just watched it, you know. And that's yeah, the no, same thing with me. I watched. And, and quite frankly, at the beginning of our show, before we we started recording with you, Jerry, I was talking to uh, to Barry, and I said. You know, your tag team with Arn Anderson, I thought, was probably one of the most underrated tag teams of the 80s. You know, people think about great tag teams like, you know, the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express, you know, all those teams that uh, came through the 80s. And your team in, in Southeast was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, it, it's a shame that you guys couldn't get a, a national uh, a gig as a tag team because I thought you guys were really good. Well, I appreciate that, you know, because we thought we were. But uh, we never got that recognition. And finally, when we did, when Ric Flair recognized it and so on, I had the, the blood clot. So Arn got to go to uh, New York. Of course, at that time, we were close to our, our uh, end of our era because we're getting older, you know, and so on and so on. And, 
uh, our body was, was taking a beating. Uh, but yeah, man, that was our time, and we just I, we just never got it. Gotcha. So Jerry, in your career too, you were really successful as both a heel and a baby face. And uh, did you have a preference? And a lot of times when we ask guys that question, the immediate response is, oh, I loved being a heel. I love that. Oh, yeah. uh, how about you? Yeah. How, how do you, do you, do you fall into that as well? Or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. uh yeah, that, that, that's the fun of it. You, you get the people up, you get them excited, you get them riled up, you get them saying what they want to say, just holler and scream. If you want to, that's what I want you to come out here. You know, you pay your money, holler and scream at me. I want you to scream at me. The more booze I get, the better I know I'm over. And, uh, so on and so on and, and man being a heel uh it, I, I mean i was a good one there's some things that i shouldn't have done when i was a heel because i made them so mad and, and some of the things people said oh you shouldn't have said that i had one guy one night he was in a wheelchair i hate to say it he's in a wheelchair he was screaming he was hollering he was throwing things at me this that and the other and i got the mic and i went over there and i said look you know i'm tired of you screaming you hollering all that but if you can't stand up and say that to me, then I don't need you saying nothing. You know, and I felt bad after I said it, but you know, you say things uh, to get them mess, you know, excited and get them hollering and screaming and other people hollering and screaming behind them. Uh, felt bad about it, but you know, all in the end, they know I didn't, I didn't mean it. So I feel like I need to ask you, uh, you know, you talk about all the guys you work with in Southeast. Uh, one of the guys that we really love talking about on the show as just being, uh, in my mind, criminally underrated, uh, was the late Brad Armstrong. And oh, also, uh, also out there on YouTube, uh, for the folks to see, there's a great sequence where you, uh, wearing the hood and as Mr. Olympia, and I want to say this is towards the latter part of the eighties, have a match where you lose the hood to the bullet, Bob Armstrong. Tell us, right. uh, your memories of working with Bob Armstrong and how, what a great talker that guy was. And Brad, who was so phenomenal in the ring. Uh, Brad was one of the best. I worked with him and his, and his other brother, Scott and Scott was, you know, he referees in WWF now, but Scott was a good one, but Brad was the best. And, uh, we just had phenomenal. I mean, we just, we could go night after night after night, uh, 30, 40, 45 minutes. It wouldn't matter to us. We just enjoyed it. But Brad was one of the best. Now, Bullet Bob, he was the master of the uh, of all the all the bro all the boys. You know, he he was the best. Me and him had some matches that you just wouldn't believe. But we had a a loser leave one night, or actually one night we had a uh, loser has to take the mask off. Of course, we knew he was Bullet Bob, but everybody wanted to see me take my mask off. You know, and so on and so on. So we did, and we lost. I lost the match and whatever. But when I pulled it off, I had one underneath, and they just went wild. They just went crazy, crazy, crazy. And we had another. Two weeks later, we went back and and had a rematch and so on. And says I can't wear one underneath. I only got one match. And then they pulled it off, and yet you know we pulled me out of the ring and they covered my my face and all that. But you know it's funny because they all knew who I was. You know, and, and so on, but they just wanted that mask off my head. And so, so sooner or later, when they got it off, they went nuts and so on and so on. Then I started being a heel as Jerry Stubbs, worked with a dirty white boy, Tony Anthony. And, and now me and him, we had a good team. Yeah, another uh, guy that was a great hand. Yeah, he, he, he was real good. We had a great team. Uh, and we, we, we had a go, uh, a go at it for a while. And you know that kept me and kept me down there in the southeastern area longer than I figured I'd ever stay, because uh, I had a run as a babyface, I had a run as a Jerry Stubbs, as Mr. Olympia, uh, uh, Jerry Stubbs again, and so on and so on. And I stayed for years, uh, you know, uh, until everything just kind of folded up. So, well, let me ask you, Jerry, as we begin uh, kind of wrapping up, we certainly appreciate you giving us your time here tonight. Uh, I did hear a story that I want to I want to talk to you about, and that was about a meeting that you had with a young Kurt Hennig where you gave Kurt an idea for a gimmick. Can you tell us about uh, talking to Kurt about Mr. Perfect? Oh, yeah, yeah. We were, we were in Japan. Me and Kurt was in Japan. He was going and, and, and so on and so on. And, and Kurt liked to drink now. He liked to drink. 
and we'd get to go out with the Japanese people, and they would take us down to this place or that place, and all the girls would come over and sit with us at the table, and we would drink whatever. And he loved, uh, uh, shoot, what was that, uh, bourbon. He loved that uh, bourbon that he got, uh, and it cost $100 a bottle now. And they, they didn't care. They get it. Hey, you want another bottle? You drink another bottle. So he was saying, you know, I got to go back to New York, and I got I got to figure out something that I can do, or I probably won't be there long. You know, they, they, they won't use me much. I got to have a gimmick. And I said, well, Kurt, well, I, I've used it just a couple of times. I said, why don't you go ahead and call yourself Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect? and get you some stuff that, that kind of matches the outfit and do this, that, and the other. And he said, well, you don't mind? You don't want to use it? I said, look, it don't look like I'm going nowhere here but to Japan, <laughs> you know. I said, so take it back with you and, and try to make some money with it and do your best. And so he did. And uh, they called him Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect, and I watched it a lot. You know, and I didn't mind at all. Gotcha. And, Jerry, was that, was that when you were working in Japan as, the, as a, a sheik? Right. I was a sheep. Me and Tiger Jet Singh, uh, he, he he got me there and one day he said, Look, why don't I need you I need a partner. Why don't you uh shave your head and go as a sheep because I had a beard and uh, use a turban and all that and he said, I'll get you booked uh several times during the year and I did. I got eight, ten, twelve times if I wanted. And we'd go and we'd work as as uh, I went as a sheep and he went as Tiger Jet Singh. <laughs> And that little thing he carried around, that little thing on the end that has the ball, boy, he he book you in a minute. <laughs> so I just followed him, boy, and he'd tear him up, and we'd do our thing. And, hey, I got some, I got some, I got a, I got pretty big over there. So, uh, Barry, so you want to uh, tell the folks about uh, someplace where uh, Jerry's going to be appearing in the near future? Yeah, absolutely, uh, too, Jeff. And I was just pulling that up, too, so you can meet Jerry Stubbs. And I know I'm going to try to get there, but Jerry Stubbs is going to be appearing with uh, Sean Royal, who was a guest on our show last week, the One Man Gang, and Boris Zukov, and it's going to be on Saturday, August the 17th at The Gathering. This is one of the largest wrestling fan fest conventions that I've ever seen. I think there's something like 70, 75 of the boys there. Uh, so this uh -huh. is definitely one of the biggest events I've ever seen anywhere. Uh, and our old friend Nick Massey of Captain's Corner is bringing in again Jerry Stubbs, Sean Royal, One Man Gang, Boris Zukov. Uh, I'm excited for this one, too, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get there. Jeff and I have been talking about it, but how much do you like going to the Fan Fest and getting to meet everybody who, who supported you all those years ago? Oh, man, it's great. And, and to see up, see the boys like Boris and several of them that I hadn't seen, uh, it, it, I mean, it's great. Uh, you know, a one-man game. I hadn't seen him since I, we did a little Fan Fest in uh, uh, New Orleans. Uh, back with Bill Watts and some other people, so that it's been a long time, you know. But these are guys that you know really was I, when I was in my prime. They they the one just I looked at and said, hey man, you know I, I'm just proud to be on the same car as some of these guys. But yeah, the one man gang, Bars Golf, Oh Bars, he he's something else. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Last time I seen him, he was in Dothan, Alabama. And I told him, I said, I got to drive to Atlanta, which is four hours. And he said, no, no, man, just, spend a, just stay with me. I got an extra bed over here. Just stay with me, get up in the morning, go, you know, you don't have to. So I said, man, I appreciate that. And uh, I stayed with him. I said, last time I seen Boris, so I, I'm going to be glad to see Boris this time. Well, one of the things that Barry likes to say here, uh, and I certainly uh, – can't uh, can't agree enough with it is that you know when you get a chance to meet these guys uh, at these fan fests guys that when you were when you were younger uh, that were uh, the object of your uh, affection and cheers or that you booed the hell out of when because they were heels uh, when you get a chance to go meet these guys just absolutely go because uh, it's nothing like it and taking a few minutes and whether it's just getting an autograph or a photo opportunity uh, shooting the breeze with these guys it's loads and loads of fun and you always have a good time. Well, you know, and bring up some stories. You know, hey, I heard this, I heard that. Hey, uh, do you remember this? Do you remember that? Because, I mean, as we get older, we forget a lot of stuff. But if you bring back to the memory, then we said, oh, man, yeah, I remember that. You know, let me tell you about that. You know, there was one incident with me. I don't know how much time you got. I'll, I'll rush through this. No, no, you're uh, there fine. Was, there was a time we were in Charlotte, matter of fact. Me, Wahoo McDaniel, 
uh, 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 Andre the Giant. We went to this place, and 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 uh, uh, Wahoo took us, and he said, "Okay." We went up to the door, and and the the glass is uh, kind of colored. You know what I mean? It's painted. So and he knocks on the door, and somebody comes to the door, and they say, oh, "Okay, Wahoo, y'all come on in." We go in there, and there's all kind of uh, gambling machines. Gambling this and gambling that and blackjack and so on and so on and so on. So we ended up playing. I ended up winning five hundred dollars that night. And I said, "Man, I'm scared. You think I, I'm gonna get out of here? Okay." So and we got uh, Andre. He he bet a man two hundred dollars that he could get all them balls. We did. Wahoo bet that we could get. He could get all them balls in one corner box. And the guy said, "Ah, he said, put your money up. He put his money up." Andre picked up the bar, the pool table, turned it to the corner, and all them balls run in one pocket. <laughs> and he, got, he grabbed the money, and the old, guy, the old guy's face was just, I mean, he was stonewalled, man. He just looked like, oh, my God. You know, uh, so on it happened. So I know I know everybody that's been out uh, on an evening with Andre has an Andre story because uh, that's just something uh, – there's a seemingly a, a never-ending supply of uh, great Andre stories. Well, hey, listen, Jerry, we want to say on behalf of Barry and myself how much we appreciate you taking some time out here of your day and uh, reminiscing a little bit about your days in Mid-South and Southeastern, Mid-Atlantic, all over the place. And uh, we really do uh, appreciate you. Thank you.